Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Steve Dooley. I'm the Executive Director here at the SFU Surrey campus. Um, welcome to a special edition of Carbon Talks, the first time we've had it at the beautiful SFU Surrey campus. Carbon Talks is a partnership with Simon Fraser University's Center for Dialogue in collaboration with SFU Beatty School of Business, the School for Public Policy, and the School for International Studies. Our goal is to advance Canadian global competitiveness by shifting to a low carbon economy. Not surprisingly, transportation is one of Carbon Talk's main streams of work, and we hold about eight public dialogues per year to help advance the conversation. So in terms of the format for today, we have three speakers. We have Barbara Steele, Anita Hubberman, and Shauna Sylvester. I will be introducing them one at a time. Uh, they're each going to talk for about eight to ten minutes, and I'm going to be the humble timekeeper with one of these things as well. Um, and then we'll uh, open it up to a, a, a fulsome discussion with the audience and people out in the, uh, the Twitter world. Uh, the Twitter hashtag for this session is hashtag BC Transpo. And they're up on the, on the board's uh, whiteboard behind me. And you can t tweet questions to at Carbon Talks or at MLR underscore BC. So in terms of the topic for today, Transportation is one of the, obviously one of the biggest issues in Metro Vancouver, but with a referendum coming up and other issues going on around this topic. Uh, here in Surrey, transportation is a, is, a, is a major issue for us as the, uh, as the city works on developing five city centers clustered around density. Clearly transportation to link the clusters is a very important topic. So transportation is huge uh, for the city of Surrey and huge for all of us south of the Fraser. So we're really glad that we're able to have this conversation today. So, for our first speaker, I'm very glad to have Councillor Barbara Steele here. Barbara has been a councillor at the City of Surrey since 1998 and is the past president of both the Lower Main Local Government Association and the Union of BC Municipalities. She serves on a number of committees, including the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and has championed transportation issues south of the Fraser. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you very much. I'm a, if, if you can't hear me, well, people that can hear me that need to hear me more had better let me know. Um, anyway, thank you for inviting the City of Surrey to this event. This afternoon, I'm going to touch on the following topics. The tremendous growth in Surrey and south of the Fraser. The importance of goods movement in our region. Surrey's transportation needs. And the 10-year investment plan that the Mayor's Council is working on. And just by way of a slight introduction, I do want to advise you that this is one of the top issues for Surrey Council. It's been a very tough issue and we're fighting it through, so I want to take you on a little walk of what we're doing. Our metropolitan area is projected to grow by a million residents in the next 30 years. Half of that growth will settle south of the Fraser. On employment growth, the City of Surrey will add 150,000 new jobs roughly half of the total growth in the region for the next 30 years. Thanks. Surrey is one of the fastest growing cities in Canada, absorbing close to 1,000 new residents each month. So in the face of this tremendous growth, the city of Surrey is facing unprecedented pressure to deliver its services, and most important of all, transportation services to meet the existing and future demands of the city. Metro Vancouver is a key terminus of the Asian Pacific Gateway. Metro Vancouver is home to the largest port in Canada that includes 28 major marine cargo terminals. Port Metro Vancouver traded $75 billion of goods and generated $10.5 billion of GDP and 130 jobs across Canada. On the trucking side, over a million trucks cross the U.S. border each year. The goods being trucked are worth over $11 billion to this region. On the rail side, the intermodal yards of CNR and CPR handle nearly $2 billion worth of goods each year. In order to move all these goods, we need an efficient road system in our region. But our system is growing more congested over the years with delays that now cost the region $800 million annually. Growing congestion in the region is unsustainable. We need a comprehensive, multimodal strategy to meet our future needs. Better bus transit service, we continue to lag behind the rest of the region. 
The rest of the region is, uh, what the rest of the region is receiving in terms of number of bus bonus per capita. We need to catch up to the regional average and especially to those services north of the Fraser. We need funding to improve our regional roads. Some of them are still two lanes that are incapable of handling existing future demand. We need a Patello bridge replacement that's capable of handling future growth on both sides of the river and allows efficient goods movement and that means to us the construction of a six lane bridge. We need light rail transit, an entire network that will serve and shape our growth in the next 30 years. And I just want to talk a little bit about our growth. Transit ridership in Surrey is growing but falling behind the region. According to the census, 12% of Surrey residents use transit, 19% residents in Metro Vancouver use transit. This is due to limited investment in transit. South of the Fraser receives 0.9 revenue hours per capita. North of the Fraser, 1.8 revenue hours. Metro Vancouver, 1.5 revenue hours per capita. So we need more transit. Over the next three decades, Surrey's population will grow by 60% and the number of jobs will double. By 2041, Surrey will be home to 800,000 people and 290,000 jobs. 48% of the region's growth will occur south of the Fraser and 70% of that will be in Surrey. Surrey's vision is for a full light rapid transit network on 104th Avenue, Fraser Highway and the King George Boulevard. The full network consists of 26 kilometers of LRT. That will meet the demand and shape growth in Surrey. LRT is more cost efficient than SkyTrain, allowing more areas to connect to frequent, comfortable and reliable transit service. South of the Fraser is the next priority for rapid trans transit investment and as we tell everybody at TransLink, it's our turn. The Patello Bridge opened in 1937. The Patello is one of the oldest bridges in the Lower Mainland. The bridge is an important regional link for the movement of goods and people. It carries an average of about 75,000 vehicles per weekday. About 10% of this is trust, tr truck traffic, as the bridge is an important goods movement connection. A replacement bridge needs to meet future demand and good movement services. So just to give you an idea of our 10-year investment plan with the Mayor's Council, in February of this year, the Mayor's Council committed to the province to prepare a 10-year investment plan. A subcommittee, which I've been lucky enough to sit on over the last few weeks, has been struck to prepare this plan. A draft plan is scheduled for the Mayor's Council's consideration by April 17th and for submission to the province by June 30th. The plan will address the management of existing assets, assets expanding core services and funding for major, major capital projects including the Broadway SkyTrain, Surrey's LRT and the replacement of the Patello Bridge. Status quo is not an option. Our region is growing and we need to plan for the future. Investment in transportation will translate, translate into economic and health benefits. A more mobile population with consumer savings infused into GDP uh, gains and a healthier population with environmental benefits. So in closing, I just want to let you know that these are the kinds of things that Surrey's fighting for. These are the things that our mayor is fighting for. These are the, the problems that face us before the mayor's council and what we're working. We are working extremely hard to push our needs forth. It, it's a tough battle in many instances, but we're getting the ear of the rest of the, of the, rest of the region, I think. So that right now is where we stand. And thank you for coming here and listening to the information presented by Surrey. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Before I turn it over to Anita, I was remiss in not acknowledging our uh, sponsors for this event. I do want to take the time to thank Carbon Talks funders, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, SFU Center for Dialogue, and the North, North Growth Foundation. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Anita Hubberman, who is the CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade. She guides a 19-member diverse industry board of directors support a to support a growing list of community groups, initiatives, and government policies from an economic lens. 
Anita was a nominee of the 2013 YWCA Woman of Distinction Award and a recipient of the 2011 Business in Vancouver's Top 40 Under 40 Award. Welcome, Anita. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you so much for having me here uh, this afternoon. Uh, for those of you that don't know who the Surrey Board of Trade is, uh, we're part of a, a global network where there is a Chamber of Commerce or Board of Trade uh, in each city all over the world. Uh, we're a voluntary-based, uh, business-focused membership group focusing on supporting business in the city as well as attracting business to the city. We focus on business connections, government advocacy, workplace development, international trade and other support services to ensure that our businesses here in Surrey continue to stay and grow. And so we, at the Surrey Board of Trade, our very comprehensive strategic plan is founded on the premise that both transportation and education are the basis of what needs to be focused on for a growing and healthy economy. That's right, transportation and education together. So I spoke at an SFU Urban Studies uh, conference last month, actually right here in Surrey, and uh, what it, I was asked to speak on was regional economic development, and that cities working together to build industry clusters locally from strategic national and international targets. But more than that, it's the concept of breaking out of silos, that protectionism that we so often see here in Metro Vancouver. Knowing that through shared resources, open communication, job growth, infrastructure needs, obtaining that human skill talent, everything is possible. It requires innovative thinking and the politics need to somehow be cut out of the equation with the overall result being to improve the quality of people's lives. Equally important what, at that event was the discussion on how economic development work is linked with important land use, transportation, housing and environmental decisions that underpin the regional economy. Regional leaders know that our high quality of life is a major reason that talented workers stay here and live here. The goal is to have a robust economy that works in harmony with our region's priorities. So let's focus on transportation and why it's important to the economy and, of course, to business. Transportation facilitates communication and commerce. The word infrastructure is used to describe all of the facilities that economy has in place, including its transportation network of bridges, uh, railways, ports, airports, vessels, etc. An adequate infrastructure system is a prerequisite to economic development. Transportation and communications are important in developing and strengthening our social and political and commercial ties locally, nationally, and internationally. And these ties must be developed, must be focused on to ensure that trade develops. We are living in a global economy. Transportation efficient transportation systems are necessary to reach markets where they can be sold or exchanged uh, for other people to also obtain merchandise and services. Transportation enables economic activity by connecting people, businesses and resources. The economic impact of an efficient public transportation system and a focus on the investments needed to create all of that is so important in many ways. They provide mobility, they can shape land use and development patterns, generate jobs and enable economic growth. So when our BC government says that they are focused on creating jobs, they must also focus on transportation, that is efficient transportation systems. 
And so ultimately, investments in public transportation and transportation infrastructure affects the economy in terms of employment, wages, and business income. So you heard from Councillor Steele on, on why and, and how it, uh, an efficient transportation system will affect our general population. It actually will increase access to jobs, mobility, getting your labor to your, your businesses. It'll reduce traffic congestion. It'll encourage more businesses to move into our area. You also heard from Councillor Steele the statistic about how we are growing by 1,200 people a month, how the South Fraser region it will have another million people by 2025. And so why are we not a priority in terms of transportation investments? We at the Surrey Board of Trade, like the City of Surrey, are huge advocates of ensuring that the right transit and transportation investments happen in Surrey. This includes light rail, uh, rebuilding the Patello Bridge. And in terms of labor mobility, and ensuring a business's success, I also have to ensure that we add to the conversation about how immigrants uh, are part of this population, that 49% of our population has a mother tongue other than English, that we also have uh, low income uh, people that need to be able to access jobs, to be able to access services. They need to uh, be able to ensure that they have access to transit, uh, that they're able to get from point A to point B so that they can improve the quality of their lives. So as communities focus on economic development, the common response has been the recruitment of industry, of outside industry. But what has been left out has been the support for our existing small businesses, our micro businesses. So Surrey is still, a, it's, a, it's a business community of small and medium-sized enterprises. But that means we're a city of entrepreneurs, we're a city of innovators. When transportation systems are efficient, they provide economic and social opportunities and benefits for both types of businesses, small and large. They result in positive multiplier effects, such as better accessibility to markets, employment, and additional investments. When transportation systems are deficient in terms of capacity or reliability, they can have an economic cost, such as reduced or missed opportunities and lower quality of life. So efficient transportation reduces costs in many economic sectors, while inefficient transportation increases costs. It, it's logical, isn't it? The impacts of transportation are not always intended and can have unforeseen or unintended consequences, such as congestion. Transportation also carries an important social and environmental load which cannot be neglected. So when we focus on our, our markets, when we focus on our labor market uh, in terms of production, trying to get goods to market locally, nationally, and internationally, when we're talking about competition, I mentioned before we live in a global economy that we need to ensure that we have efficient and reliable transportation systems to move our goods, to move our people. We need to ensure that we're able to get our product to market. And this will further enhance our land values to ensure that Surrey is the best that it can possibly be. So I look forward to your questions and uh, making sure that Surrey has the best transportation systems that it needs to grow our businesses and to attract our businesses to the city of Surrey. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, very much. Um, and thank you for the first couple of speakers. We're right on time. I must be a really good moderator, or you guys are just right on time. <laughs> right on so top thank you very much. Um, Anita, you talked about breaking down silos. Our, our next speak speaker really loves breaking down silos. Um, Sean Sylvester is a fellow 
at Simon Fraser University Center for Dialogue, the Executive Director of Carbon Talks, and Executive Director of SFU Public Square, which establishes Simon Fraser University as the go-to convener of serious and productive conversations about issues of public concern, like what we're here for today. Sean. Thanks so much, Stephen. Now I get to have fun. First of all, it's an absolute delight to be on this panel with the two of you. Uh, what a treat. Now I'm going to start with a bit of a quiz. Um, we're going to just test a little bit of your, your, your knowledge on transit issues. So my first question to you, let's just make sure I've got, when did public transit extend to south of the Fraser River? Now you can see the options, so I'm going to ask, who believes, and just put up your hand, it was A, 1964. This is where we get to see who's really shy, because then I can see how many of you don't put up your hands. B, 1968. Okay. C, 1910. <laughs> D, 1980. Okay. Now, the reason we have the correct answer is actually due to somebody in this room. There he is, Peter Holt. Uh, we had the answer wrong the first time we did this quiz, and Peter, who works with the on a great deal on archive issues here in Surrey, uh, corrected us. It is C nineteen ten. Okay, so C nineteen ten, and public transit extended to south of the Fraser in nineteen ten. It was the interurban line from Vancouver through Surrey into Chilliwack in the Fraser Valley. Okay, question number two: True or false? In Metro Vancouver, cars are the most popular mode of transportation for short trips. That's up to two kilometers. So who says true? Okay. And who says false? And who's not sure? There's a few of you. <laughs> OK, well, let's see. True. It is true. Um, if you look at the, you can, you can see how that goes in terms of trip length, and it's quite startling to see uh, just how much we rely on our cars. I know I do a little bit too much, but there we are. So I think this is the last question. Yes, it is. It's a chance to test your knowledge. What percentage of trips in Metro Vancouver are made by transit? And this is 2011. This isn't easy. Now, is it A, 9%, B14, C22, D30, and you know, you can always call home to a friend. So which one is it? A, who's going to take 9%? B14, C22, and D30. I think if we had listened to Councillor Steele, we would have got that one at 14%. So that was great. So why are we talking about transportation right now? And uh, I think that we've heard very good reasons why we're talking about transportation. We have ex expected by 2041 a million new jobs, sorry, a million new people, that's a, a correction on the slide, and 600,000 plus new jobs by 2041. Imagine 700,000 more cars on the road. My daughter, who is a student here in first year, uh, constantly tells me all of these changes are going to come very easily in her life when she's an adult, more of an adult than she is now. She says, these aren't far away, so 700,000 more cars. Um, although this is a contested number because many feel it is far higher than this, congestion is costing us, according to Transport Canada, up to $1.5 billion per year. That is a lot of money, and I think, if I'm correct, that could come close to paying for the light rapid transit. Uh, in Surrey. We need infrastructure, clearly. Um, our infrastructure is decaying to some extent. We also need to take a major modal shift away from single occupant vehicles. That's the congestion. That's what's causing so much of our GHG emissions on the roads. And um, I think uh, that Anita also spoke to the issue of transit-oriented, that whole use of land use planning, linking transportation-centered development. So some basic reasons why we need to have this conversation. Now let me explain what I'm doing today, and that is really launching the Moving in a Livable Consortium. It's a, it's a, a really interesting gathering of people and very uh, mixed group of people, I might add. Now at Simon Fraser University Center for Dialogue is the convener, and there is only one basis of unity. And when I go through who on, is on this consortium, you'll see why it's so clear why it's important to be very, very clear of why we're at the table. And that is to get sustainable funding regime for transportation in the region. That is our number one goal. It is the reason why each of us are there. And our framing is transportation in the economy. 
Now let's look at some of the people that are around the table. If you were to think of the local government, the local government is there. You also have in particular the city of Surrey and the city of um, Vancouver. You have Mayor's Council. You have Metro Vancouver. You have TransLink at the table. We also have the business community at the table. BC Business Council, some of the uh, business improvement associations, some of the boards of trade are at that table. We also have things like the Urban Development Institute, the Urban Land Institute, um, taxi drivers, the Gateway Council. So those that are really concerned around both land use planning, but also goods movement are at that table, and people movement. And then we have many different kinds of coalitions that work on active transportation or sustainable transportation. And here and we have Surrey Links and a couple of other Surrey organizations. So it's a very, um, it's a gathering of odd bad bedfellows and not at the same time. Uh, Get On Board, which also reflects a number of student organizations, is at the table. So here's what we do. We conduct research. We've done some of the most extensive research on referenda in North America. We've provided and we've heard Minister Stone quote our work quite consistently on information about um, active and positive referenda on transportation. We are in, our interest is to provide evidence-based, fact-based information on transportation to get to have a place that you can weed through or get through the, the weeds to look at the information uh, where there's an evidence-based. evidence, evidence based. And we are also providing our educational website. I'm just going to take you through a couple of the pages on that. Um, first, there are 10 fast facts that you can go to. That'll give you really quick information on transportation. There is also, I gave you a couple of the questions from that quiz. I really challenge you to take the quiz. Nobody has scored 100% on that quiz yet. The closest was Mike Harcourt. I think he got 9 out of 10. And when all of the me members of the staff of the BC Transportation staff and the ministry did it, together, collectively, they got 9 out of 10. But the former, I, 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 uh, the last time I was on a panel focused on referenda, it was with the former chair of TransLink, and she got 8 out of 10. We both sort of scored as transportation gurus, but we didn't have the final, you know, we didn't get the higher. And, uh, but try out the quiz. Uh, there's a section of the blog, and we invite um, people who have been working in the transportation to submit uh, postings for that blog. It is a refereed blog, but we invite um, uh, people who want to be uh, speaking on transportation issues that are focused on evidence-based information to submit their ideas. Um, we have re resources and news on the referendum, although it is rather scant these days. Have you noticed that the information on the referendum has declined quite suddenly in the media? Uh, there are community profiles, a resource library, and more to come. And we would love your ideas because really it has to reflect what you need as, you, as we go into this referendum, what you need to hear. So we'd love your ideas. What can you do to help get involved with moving in a livable region? Our goal is as we go into a referendum, and I think many of the members of our, of our consortium are nervous about a referendum. This is a highly, highly complex issue to try and address through a referendum. And so I, I think I speak for most of our members when they take a big, deep breath and go, oh my goodness, what are we up against? So we are facing one, nevertheless, and we're hoping that the... Uh, the investment strategy that, that, that your subcommittee comes up with in June gives us some sign of what that question might be. But you can engage with us on Twitter, on Facebook. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can share Moving in a Livable Region information. And most of all, uh, I think this is, this is a community development approach um, to organizing. The most important thing you can do coming out of today is to host a conversation with some of your friends around, it could be around your kitchen table, um, people over supper, but to start talking about transportation, its importance, and some of the different ways in which you can think of how do we get out of this really difficult situation where it is going to cost us money and the sources of those funds aren't altogether clear. So learn about the referendum and engage at least three or four people as you walk out this door today um, on that referendum. I'm going to leave it there and Hand it back to you, Stephen, for questions. Wow, thank you very much. It was also read in the number 10 minutes. There you go. So I, uh, I'm, I'm guessing some people in the audience want to ask some questions. 
So what we're going to do is I'll facilitate. Uh, this is a Kian over here. He's got a microphone. He's going to work the room with the microphone. And when you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll come over to you and get your question. And make sure you identify who you want the question addressed to, and we'll give uh, everybody on the panel a chance to uh, comment as well. And I think, Doug, you've got a, you wanted to. First of all, let me thank you for, for hosting this and, and for the presentation. Um, I, I'm going to be very quick. I only have five, um, I have five actually suggestions because one of the things um, that I have felt with uh, transportation um, of people and goods in the region in the last little while that no decisions have been made. And there's been, um, and it's starting to slide um, even further. So I, I've got, I, I just want to give to the um, panel five very, very quick suggestions. The first one on governance. Um, I think when TransLink did make decisions and um, was when they first were formed, and it was with all the mayors in the region on a board. Um, it was a very rocky board. It was a very um, tough decision process, but um, they did make decisions. They, they bought the world's largest um, amount of trolley electric buses in the world. In fact, when a lot of cities were doing away with trolley buses, um, TransLink went out and bought um, trolley buses. Um, it built uh, the Golden Ears Bridge, um, and it built and financed and, or helped finance the um, Canada Line. So they made some, in six years, made some tremendous um, hard decisions. And they were very controversial, some of them, but they made those decisions. When the board was disbanded and it went to um, private um, people on the board, away from politicians, in the last nine years, that board has made zero major decisions. Um, and so I think in governance, and I congratulate the province because they brought legislation in to bring the board of TransLink back to be mayors. And you know, mayors are accountable. They're, they're one step removed from directly getting elected to TransLink. But at the same time, when they go out to campaign this year, they're going to be talking to their community about the decisions on TransLink's um, uh, transportation. So um, I think the governance is, um, should be um, all mayors. Second is Botello Bridge. It's been kicked around with a political football for 20 years that I'm aware of, if not longer. My suggestion is, and this goes back to the original TransLink's board suggestion, was that we don't need a new bridge. Um, we should just um, upgrade this new bridge. Um, the cost for that is $300 million. Um, that money was put aside with uh, TransLink, and I think it's still there, put aside for that means. That uh, maintenance or, or fixing it up would um, last another 30 to 50 years. And I think you, in those years, you will see pattern or traffic patterns start to change and so forth. Um, and a cost of a new bridge will be somewhere approximately a billion dollars. So I think it would be good money spent just to upgrade it. The safety issue in the lanes, cars are getting smaller um, and narrower. Um, I, I, in fact, drive a very small car, a narrow car, and um, the lanes on the Patello Bridge, um, um, I think over the years will be better because of the smaller cars. Um, Third, tolling or uh, tolling policy, the provincial one. Um, I think this is a, a tough decision to look at, but I think the current policy is good. Um, I think we often in the region always criticize all good policies, um, and, and I think that's fair. But the ones that are good should stay in place, and the current policy shouldn't be changed. It's basically that if a new structure is built, then it could be told as long as the public has the choice to go um, another way free. And I think it's a good policy. If we look at the Fraser River, we have seven bridges that cross that are free, and we have two that are paying. Um, and so I think um, that provides lots of opportunity um, for um, the, mo the movement of goods and people. Um, Doug, Doug, sorry, yeah. but w with great respect, um, we need to, I want to make sure everybody else gets okay. a chance to hear. Two so. more, rapid transit. Um, I think um, it's got a history of, um, of votes. Um, 
in the region in the right order, Expo, Millennium Line, Canada Line, Evergreen Line, Surrey's Turns Nights, like Rail Line, and then the Broadway cor Corridor. Number five, very quickly, two financing things. Large, rapid uh, infrastructure should always go one-third province, one-third federal government, one-third TransLink, or another body or a private sector, making it a P3. And the final one um, is revenue on an ongoing basis in TransLink. Um, there's a lot of things, and this is a referendum, but the simplest, and you have to make it simple to the public, otherwise it won't pass. The simplest uh, is the 0.5% uh, sales tax increase. TransLink needs $200 million each year to improve their services. That 0.5 in the metro area would bring in $225 uh, million per year. Thank you. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to comment? I'd like to hear from others. Okay. Are there questions? You got one right here. I think they're just working on that. Other questions, guys? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, qu my question uh, is something which I'm sure I'm not the only person uh, has wondered about, and that is why, why are we having a referendum? There was no referendum on the billions that were spent on the port man. There's no referendum on replacing the Massey Tunnel. And is it just a technique to avoid or postpone spending on transit? I'd really welcome if anybody can throw some light on why we're having a referendum. Well, um, pretty much your guess is as good as ours. Um, I think we're having a referendum because the province says we're having a referendum, and I don't know that there's any other more intelligent reason than that. It was uh, an election promise that Premier Clark had made, and so she has to follow through with it. But I have to say that uh, with any other transit types of referendums that have happened, and, and we've assessed it either within the United States or globally, they have been multi-year educational campaigns mm -hmm. because transportation itself, as Shauna has said, is very complex. Uh, there are uh, different elements uh, that need to be understood and not everyone understands the complexity. And so pushing this to referendum, I agree, it should not happen. But uh, this is an election promise that the provincial government uh, has to follow through. I think it's also, um, we've got a, a referendum. I think we spent months, in fact, moving in a livable region actually existed six months before the referendum was called. We sat around the table and said, we need to start working on transportation funding issues. And we were hosting a major um, all-party candidates meeting on transportation in Vancouver, um, although all of the candidates were from Fraser Valley for the most part. Um, and uh, and it was that was when we had heard just a day or two before the announcement. And I'll be really honest, if I was watching that announcement and I was a member of the Premier staff, I think it was off the top. I don't know that a lot of thought went into it. And then it became a promise, and then it became an ironclad promise. And then I will say, however, after a fair bit of pushback from many, many different sectors, um, there was uh, a sense that they needed more time. And that's where, the, uh, where Minister Stone started to work more closely with the Mayor's Council and the Investment Subcommittee was created. So the reality is we have one. Our re research shows that if you have a clear question, you have a good education campaign, you have both a strong advocacy coalition, which MLR is not, so we need a strong advocacy coalition that's on the yes side, if it's a good question. Uh, and then you need a place to go to for really good sound information, which is the role we're trying to play. Then you can win. 73% of referenda in North America have won. So it's possible to win this if we get the right ingredients. The reality is, whether we like it or not, there's a referendum. And we cannot afford to have any further delay on money coming to transportation. I think um, Anita made the case very clearly about the economic costs to us if we do delay. 
I just want to add to that, aside from my sort of off-the-cuff remark, um, the importance of this, and that's why we're fighting so hard at the subcommittee in order to get transit and a question that's able to be supported uh, well by the south of the Fraser region because we do need the money, we do need the transportation. So that is the purpose of what we're working so hard to do. Okay. There's a question from over here. There's one right in the middle here. Uh -oh. So you can pass it along like they do at football games, you know, the hot Dutch. Thank you. My name is Colin Lachlan. I work with a company called Logical Carbon Solutions. We're in the uh, freight industry, freight transportation. And I wanted to ask you uh, to just tell me a little bit more about the focus on the freight component of the transportation growth in the lower mainland here. Just, <coughs> I, I, w I live in the area, and last year I happened to receive um, a phone call. It was a survey. Uh, question, uh, it was randomly selected on talking about the six-lane development of the bridge, either a replacement or a parallel to the Patolo. In the survey questions that I was asked, it was identified that four of those lanes would be dedicated to truck traffic. So that indicates a, a severe increase in, in freight transportation by way of drayage in the area here. Uh, some figures in that regard that I'm familiar with is that currently, on an environmental side, uh, this year, they're within the Port Metro Vancouver greater region of the lower mainland here, which includes all the municipalities, we're currently at about 100,000 metric tons of CO2E. Uh, that's predicted to go up three times to triple by 2030, double by 2025, and then like a hockey stick, it's going to shoot up to, to triple by 2030. That's data from the uh, Port Metro Vancouver landside uh, inventory, landside emissions inventory. So. With respect to freight transportation as a component of the overall problem, uh, is the panel or, or the group uh, working with Port Metro Vancouver with respect to addressing any of that component of the congestion that is going to arise just from freight transportation alone and, of course, the environmental impact? There are issues, of course, being talked about. There's an inland terminal. There are issues with regard to land use at Delta Port for moving rail in that you could have a, a more economic or more environmentally friendly movement of a large portion of containers uh, without the drayage problem. But what what's going on in, in the freight transportation talk part of that? That's really what I want to know. Well, I don't have a direct answer for you. All I can say is uh, right now, Port Metro Vancouver is going through a land use plan consultation. And uh, in terms of our work with them as a business organization to ensure that goods get to market either locally, nationally, or internationally, uh, there, that has to be part of the equation in terms of an efficient, uh, transportation system needs to incorporate freight traffic. It needs to include the ports and, uh, and of course, uh, Fraser Surrey Docks is, is part of that equation also. So uh, our transportation team at the Board of Trade is uh, just finalizing their response to PMV about their land use plan. And um, otherwise, I, you know, that's all I can say about that from, from our perspective. Uh, well, just briefly, it hasn't really been a major portion of the discussions at the subcommittee at this point in time, although we are all well aware, and, and obviously rapid transit and light rail are, are the ways to avoid a lot of the emissions that are happening out there right now and getting the cars off the road. Um, those discussions are more at this point taking place through the committees, through Port Metro Vancouver, through the committees, and coming back to the Board of Metro Vancouver where I hear them but I'm not actively involved in all of those discussions. So a couple of things. I'm moving in livable region gateways there and through um, Port Metro. That's where Port Metro uh, is represented at, at moving in livable region. But the whole question of the GHG issue has a lot to do with congestion too in terms of the extent to which our freight is being caught in congestion and double, triple times and those emissions go skyrocketing. So I know that the Trucking Association, as an example, is doing work in this field and trying to figure out 
um, how to address that issue. Uh, I know that the reason why the Gateway is at Moving in a Livable Region and is such a strong advocate for finding funding for transportation, and particularly public transportation, is to free up the lanes for goods movement. So um, this is one of those areas where we can have, it's very hard to find people uh, against this, against having a better funded system for transportation in the region, particularly for public transportation, because most of the major, major um, groups that we think might be against that uh, are not. They're very much in favor of seeing far better use of the existing road infrastructure. We can't build our way out of congestion. We can't continue to add roads. Now, I think the questions you're asking, Colin, are far more sophisticated than what we've just responded to. I think you've got series of, when you're talking about inland terminals, you're talking about rail. I don't think we've gotten that far in the conversation. Uh, we haven't around MLR, but that is certainly a direction that we might go as time goes along. But I guess I have a follow-up to your question. Is there, um, you know, we're doing this dialogue today, and this is great, but is there a way to to capture comments like that in terms of how Colin might be able to kind of feed that information into, into, into the process. Well, I'm glad you actually yeah. brought that up, Colin, because then I can take it back to my transportation team at the Board of Trade. So the, all, dialogues are great because we, we get new perspectives and new ideas and, uh, and add that to the conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, there we are. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is William Gibbons, and uh, I wanted to thank all the panelists. But the the real person I'd like to figure out who's who on is uh, Peter Holt. Where's Peter Holt? Oh, hi. Uh, I want to touch base with you after. And the reason is uh, I've done some of my own research uh, on history of transportation-oriented development in Surrey. Uh, some of it funded by SFU, uh, Metro Vancouver, or should I say GVRD? And, um, and TransLink. And um, I think history can inform us a lot about uh, transportation-oriented development in Surrey, in particular the fact that uh, Mayor Diane Watts' massive development plan for central Surrey is a century-old replay of the origins of Centre City. And that is an ideal city that was marketed worldwide in Great Britain, Asia, Europe, and, nor and the USA as um, what would be the biggest city on the west coast of North America where we would never make the mistakes of the past because now we have engineering and efficiency. The entire rug was pulled out from under millions of dollars of speculative real estate uh, within two years in 1913. And the premier of the day called it a massive fraud because the railway barons that sold that real estate and clear-cut virgin forests to do so secretly negotiated a switch to Vancouver, which is shades of Gregor Robertson's switch play last year when he promoted the Broadway line. So I'd suggest you have Mr. Holt up on the panel sometime if you want to talk about transportation-oriented development. Because well, we'll, we'll one thing on. he would say, on the next panel, but do you, fair do you enough. Have a question for the one panel? thing he would say is that the mayors fell all over themselves to rip out the streetcar lines that were a network throughout Greater Vancouver, all the way out to Chilliwack, multimodal, industrial, commercial, and public transportation system. Okay. Today, with all of our high technology and politics. It's a gong show where we don't have a fully integrated multimodal system and we can barely afford to install one new leg. So it's a big challenge and we're not doing a good job. So I have two questions for our panelists. Number one, GVRD and TransLink have rebranded themselves from a transportation authority to, to TransLink from uh, GVRD to Metro Vancouver, from a sustainable region plan to a growth plan. And, you know, do our pundits on the panel believe that rebranding will give us the political and judgmental impetus that we need to move forward in this region? And second of all, how can we have a public dialogue, let alone 
a referendum when there's virtually no ability for individual members of the public to contribute to the discussion. For example, if you buy a transit pass, a year-long pass, you don't get a vote on transit. You don't, there's no vehicle for anyone that actually uses the public transportation system to democratically participate in the judgments. And I think the public's getting tired of political appointees running the show because you haven't been doing a good job. Okay, and so, you, so you, really let's talk about effective ways to have public dialogue about the thing without pulling the plug. Well, I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance. If you guys wanted to comment on these questions? Sure, I'll take a, take a stab at um, It will not be the first time that you and I disagree. Um, like for example, <laughs> as an independent candidate in the provincial election, you told me that an independent candidate wasn't welcome on the panel in France. That's right. That's because right. I wasn't a member of a political party. With all due respect, Shauna, that is ridiculous. Um, have Please no problem defending my, my position Thanks. on having an all-party candidate. Uh, um, and they were party candidates, uh, not independents. Uh, so in terms of the issue of public dialogue, I think it is, it's all, I think it's, there's a bigger question here, is how do individuals within the context of a referendum and within the context of this conversation get involved? I mean, to, to defend, in a sense, um, the Premier's decision here, and I, and, and I don't usually find myself defending this decision because it's not a decision, I, I'll be very frank, that I have agreed with, that I think that this issue is too complex for a referendum. But to defend it, I think that the Premier was very much coming from a place of saying, this is about uh, increased funding. And we saw what happened with the, with the HST, and I do not want to be leading an initiative that does what the HST did. So I am going to put this in the hands of uh, voters to make a decision. I am going to bring something like this, which requires increased financing, and it's going to require us paying more somewhere to individuals. So that's where I would say that there is a, um, we do have a voice here. And how we exercise that, the extent to which we engage in this issue, is a real opportunity for us to do so. Whether we agree or not with the referendum, there's an opportunity here. Well, I, I will say, first of all, that this is a good example of a place to, to state your opinions, and there's people here that are listening, and I, for one, can share those opinions and, and take them back to the, the committee that I sit on. Um, it hasn't been an open discussion at, at, at the committee that I sit on at this point in time, but uh, certainly the information is coming back. We get it from our from our constituents all the time in the various areas. So I wouldn't say that we're not listening and we're not hearing what the people have to say. Um, I, I agree that the decision is now going very public and it will in the form of a referendum whether or not um, you care for the idea of referendum and I didn't and I, I still don't but I it's there and we have to deal with it and from that in that regard we are listening we're having meetings we're continuing to talk and we're taking back the input hopefully of the public to help form that question that will get what I hope is positive results for, for funding, at least in the city of Surrey. Okay, I believe there's a question over here. Yes. Oh, you got a. There's a question from Twitter as well uh, okay. to the panel. Uh, it seems LRT is being pushed above other options. Why is that for Surrey? What are the other options and why have they been omitted? Well, the other option at this point in time would be SkyTrain. And um, there's probably, there's, there's talk of SkyTrain going along the Fraser Highway. We still haven't determined that. For the city of Surrey, we feel that LRT is the answer because we want to connect six town centers. And that's, that's a good way to do it. We do have industrial, or not industrial, pardon, we do have industrial land, but we do have agricultural land, that kind of thing that we have to get across and, and um, work into our decision. And we feel that SkyTrain is serving a purpose by getting us from, from one point to the other, for, for instance, from Surrey to Langley, or Surrey to Burnaby, Surrey to Vancouver. All of those things are, are um, great with um, uh, SkyTrain. But LRT is a better solution for south of the Surrey, and I include Delta and Langley in both Langleys in this, um, in this transit line. And it's also more efficient. It's, it's um, better for us with regards to emissions and to that kind of stuff, and it's also more expensive, or more, it's also cheaper, and it's a money saver to the city, so. 
those are our reasons. Okay, there's a question, gentleman here. Oh, oh sorry. Um, sorry, um, I, uh, I was just wondering, we talked a lot about the sort of what we're looking for and only touched a little bit on the funding options and I'm wondering if you could each uh, share what you think the best options are for funding leavers. <laughs> Um, before I do that, I also want to acknowledge Nathan Woods, who's a member of our um, Moving in a Livable Region and represents Unifor, uh, the bus drivers, and we've had really good work from the um, labor community within MLR, so I wanted to acknowledge that, because I didn't earlier and I should have. Funding, that's a really tough one. Okay, so there are many different, you've heard the 0.5% sales tax, and, and there are many. Um, mayors came forward in March of last year with a whole strategy, which included carbon tax, sales tax, a portion of the carbon tax, sales tax, vehicle levy, um, and some, I th there may have been some road pricing over the long term. We did a series, and I know that there are some people in the room that participated in these sessions, we did a series of regional dialogues on mobility pricing and looking specifically at various types of mobility pricing, including um, tolls is one, but distance-based pricing, uh, any kind of thing that would actually do, you've got parking as well in relationship to um, mobility pricing, but there's a whole range of different kinds of high occupancy toll lanes, uh, various different types of mobility pricing. And it was fascinating in that the work that we did, we did it throughout Surrey, uh, we did throughout all 22 communities, um, We focused on four regional dives, but we included 20, all 22 communities of Metro Vancouver and citizens. They were entirely citizens uh, driven. And it was interesting how much more citizens learned about mobility pricing, the more their interest in fair, equitable uh, type of mobility pricing. Uh, so we asked them, if you were designing a pricing, if you were looking at funding, what would be your principles? First and foremost, it had to be equitable. It had to be fair, it had to be balanced, and whatever money was being generated had to go to offset the costs. So I think when citizens learn about these issues, they are very intelligent in looking at different options. So um, I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. I think that there's, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. Um, and we've gotta figure out how, to, how do we find those big investments, because these are not small investments that we need. Anita? And I think, um, like Shauna, you know, these are very complex, difficult decisions and that uh, the Board of Trade itself uh, has been advocating for a regional road pricing type of system in order to pay for the capital infrastructure needs uh, that we need to happen for the benefit of our economy, uh, not only locally, uh, not only nationally, but internationally. And so uh, the whole concept of road pricing uh, needs to be explored further. It needs to be fair. It needs to be equitable. We live in a very unique economic region in Metro Vancouver. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, just for my industry, there's 21 chambers of commerce boards of trades within our own economic region that we work with on transportation issues. And in fact, uh, Peter uh, Holt, who's my predecessor at the Board of Trade, uh, he also participated on the Lower Mainland Chamber's transportation panel, uh, and as does uh, the Surrey Board of Trade. So, I mean, these are very complex issues, but road pricing has to be part of that conversation. Well, um, it is very complex, and it's, it's difficult to say the best, at least because nobody wants an increase. That, that sort of common knowledge. Um, but uh, our mayor has certainly indicated her preference to road pricing. And I think one of the reasons for that, and as, a, as we've talked about before, um, all the bridges going in and out of Surrey, if they do, if they toll the pr uh, Patello as well, there's no way, other than Alex Fraser, there's no way in and out of the city of Surrey without paying tolls on the bridges. And we're the people that pay them. So road pricing appeals to the council and the mayor in the city of Surrey because that is so far the most equitable way we've come up with. And certainly being stuck with all the tolls um, in the area it is not sitting well with us, as you might well know, and it's not gonna sit well with the people in this room either, so. Well, as a resident of Surrey for 20 years, I like that all three of you said equitable. Yes. <laughs> that seemed to be a, a big theme in the conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter Holt. 
Uh, moving in a livable region, one of the uh, topics that I think drives moving in a livable region is, the, is not just growth in the sense of, uh, we always talk about growth, but it's our port. Port Metro Vancouver and its importance to Canada, uh, its reach across North America, uh, the increasing reach and the plans for the port, put an enormous burden on the transportation routes. We've seen some significant increases in the capacity uh, to move the trucks in the port for the drayage and everything else, and also the impact of the railway lines uh, that are increasing uh, in terms of their capacity. I think we need probably to have a much more public discussion about the expansion of the port and the impact it has, because uh, there's a feeling that in the, in the background there's Port Metro Vancouver driving through its agenda with very little um, consideration at times for particularly the South of Fraser region. And when we go along and look at the growth, and you're talking about, I don't know, five, 600,000 people south of the Fraser, and you're also talking about that increase in the port, there are significant things beyond just the Roberts Bay corridor and a few overpasses. The other things that are really important are the wear and tear on roads is significant from heavy vehicles. It's almost insignificant from many of those small cars. So the benefits for the port go right across Canada. If you're a Winnipeg prairie, uh, prairie farmer, if you're moving coal, we won't get into that issue, but if you're moving coal, <laughs> and those, they benefit the whole of Canada. I think the third, 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 federal, provincial, and municipal maybe need to be re-looked at in this context. And maybe the federal government should be uh, lobbied. And I know Anita and your team do that quite a lot. You were there last week, I think, in Ottawa. Uh, need to be lobbied and said, look, this is a Canadian-wide thing. Um, this is something that we need to have a greater uh, discussion about. And more funding needs to come from those who benefit from it outside this region. So my question is, are we actually, is there anything in play that is looking at uh, trying to engage the federal government, I know it's not easy to get money out of them, but engage the, the federal government on that particular topic. So we were uh, in Ottawa last week, and my policy manager was, but more specifically around the dredging of the Fraser River and having a sustainable funding model for our river around um, making sure that it's recognized as a national entity. And so we met with uh, the Prime Minister's office, the Minister of International Trade, uh, Minister of National Revenue, various MPs to make our case. And uh, they asked us to come back with a business plan. Of course, they didn't ask for a business plan for investments for the St. Lawrence Seaway. But uh, everything seems to be focused on the Eastern Corridor all the time. So uh, we are engaging in that conversation, Peter, and I think you are so right when uh, we talk about Port Metro Vancouver and uh, people, g the general population not understanding what a significant entity this is to our local economy. When we saw the, the strike with the trucks, um, I'm on the National Film Board and I travel across the country quite often. The impacts, uh, the severe detrimental economic impacts that it had across our nation and uh, the, the brand loss that Port Metro Vancouver faced nationally, internationally, uh, really compromised us and it's not fixed by any means. Uh, there have been some licensing issues that have been modified by Port Metro Vancouver, but these are Band-Aid solutions and more needs to be done. And we're certainly hearing uh, from our, our grain companies here in Surrey, um, our lumber companies, etc. So uh, we are dialoguing with them. More needs to happen. More education needs to happen. 
And uh, in terms of uh, the wear and tear on, on local roads from trucks, we're, we're definitely aware of that um, on our transportation committee. We were huge advocates of the South Fraser Perimeter Road being built as part of the Gateway Corridor by the BC government. Uh, we're um, seeing some of the, the good effects of that to drive truck traffic through those corridors. And, uh, and and hoping to see more results. But uh, we're in observation mode, but again, uh, more dialogue needs to happen. Shauna, did you want to come? I'm not sure that I, I can answer your question very easily, Peter. Um, I think that uh, I was very excited to see the extent to which transportation was a priority in some of the budgeting um, by the federal government. And so that, says to me that there is a door that's open there for, and we know that. I think we do know that, that the federal government is interested in, in investing in infrastructure and transportation. Um, I think that they're, I don't know what they think of what we're doing provincially here. I hope that that door doesn't close before we can get our act together in terms of de defining um, what we need. Um, in terms of uh, broader discussion, I think you're right, although I will say out of the interest of the committee to stay focused, our focus will be the referendum at the front end. Well, I won't add anything much more to what Anita's already said, except to say that City of Surrey and staff and engineering department obviously is aware of what's happening to our roads and is on, to is on top of it, um, to my knowledge, from what I hear, uh, quite on top of it quite regularly. And the only other thing I can say is that uh, Penny Pretty, who's known to everybody, is the Metro Vancouver appointed director to Port Metro, so she would also be a good source of information. Okay. Hello, I, uh, Graham Jones here. I just wanted to go back to congestion, and um, I was gonna ask this question because I thought someone's gonna ask this question, and then no one asked this question, so. Well, now um, somebody is, so. Yeah, you. so there we go. Um, thank you, first of all, all three of you. It's been really interesting to hear your perspectives. Um, Shauna, I wanna go back to, you said congestion is a main cause of the CO2 emissions, or a main focus we need, you know, is essentially what you said. And I'm gonna go back to what Councillor Steele said here, which is, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing you, so. Um, how do you reconcile the, all the, earlier in your talk, you talked about uh, road expansion, um, and um, I, I know about the pinch points in the region, obviously, the bridges, the tunnel, exactly. But what was really surprising to me was the two lanes as a priority to make them wider. And road expansion in, you know, north of the Fraser Transit is successful. You know, mind you, investments is what we're trying to get south of the Fraser. So my question is, how do you reconcile that um, even some of the most problematic areas, like even Toronto has admitted their 401 is too big, and uh, LA said that we made mistakes for turning the page. How do you reconcile that with uh, Surrey's plan to expand some of the roads with the plans to reduce congestion? I just, I'm not accusing you of anything, I just want to hear the rationale. And, and thank you, they're, not, they're not, not meant to be contrary in any way. Um, it's just simply that we've got some very narrow um, uh, roads um, in, in the um, agricultural land and some of those farmland areas that really need to be expanded a bit to meet with the major road networks. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about widening and, and um, it seems contrary to not wanting more cars in the region, but it is a way of, in, in, in Surrey and some places south of the Fraser, we don't have the sophisticated major road network that a lot of the, the other areas do. So we're just looking at some of those roads to expand so that they fit into what we have. And um, we got engineering staff behind you there if, if you want more information on that. <laughs> but that's basically what we're, what we're looking at. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm just cognizant of the time. We have till about quarter after, so I'm not sure that we're going to get all through all the questions, but we'll have a few more questions, then we might give everybody a chance to do a quick wrap-up. I was going to take as much time as Doug took, but I guess I can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> um, and with respect, I just want to s touch on a few points. Doug, the P3 partnership that you're referring to when it comes to three-way funding of infrastructure, we know the P3 funding doesn't work. The free, or, uh, the New Portman Bridge ended up going to a Crown Corporation. The Golden Ears, Fairgates, and uh, what was the third one I was thinking? Ever, Evergreen Line. Those are all P3 funded projects that are going to go south and we're going to be paying for those for decades to come when our population is increasing. And I think that BRTs are something that Surrey should be looking at as well instead of just LRTs. 
BRT's success throughout Europe and South America has been um, widely, widely known and limiting yourself to or, or changing the, the landscape of Surrey so drastically for LRTs is something that I'm a little concerned about. But the bigger question that I have, and Shauna said that we all have to take something home here. And for me, the perspective that I, and I represent Metro Vancouver Transit operators. So, so I'm also representing the transit user. It's a two-fold uh, operation here that I think is really important. If the funding pro project fails, if the mayors come back and Victoria rejects the offer, and we don't have a deal until 2017 on any progressive movement of funding towards transit needs today, what are we going to do in the interim? There isn't, we, there's a surplus reported of $350 million at TransLink with a, operating in the black for the last 15 years. In two years, we're going to be at 2003 service levels. When is any sort of investment going to come into the region today? A 56.5% ridership increase from Maple Ridge alone let alone any other region. And I hear south of the Fraser, north of the Fraser. I actually came here thinking that the politics would be set aside on this issue, and it's, it shouldn't be that Surrey should be next. We know every five years, major infrastructure comes in on transit. Now it's just a coin toss between Vancouver and Surrey on who gets what. This, the real issue is the congestion that you raised over there, sir, and the congestion that maintains uh, Toronto says the highways are too big and it's, it's creating a problem. It is transit needs for the user that needs to be improved upon. And rubber on road is the first priority. With such a shortfall right now, it's going to be, I don't know how you're going to repair the damage for the user or the, the you know, the employees, the labor. Uh, you know, how do you address going back and saying, uh, and one other thing, Shauna, you said 70 odd percent of the referenda are successful. I dare you to, to tell me that that number is the same on the first round. To my colleagues. <laughs> I'm looking to one of my colleagues. On the first round? I think it's just a total number, but you're right that many of us have still been quite successful. Like Denver, Denver is a good uh, example of how they have been. So it usually takes two or three rounds. Yeah, so just so that we repeat what Claire Havens, who is one of our transportation researchers and uh, program manager for, for this field at, at Carbon Talks, is that that is a round number. It isn't specific. And yes, in many cases, they do need to go um, over uh, more than once. Um, I think you ask the fundamental question, what's plan B? There is no plan B. That's, that's what's so compelling for us as citizens here, is what do we do here? This is an urgent, urgent situation. There is no plan B. And, um, and I think the most important, and, and knowing the time, this will be my last thing, Stephen, the most important thing we can do is educate ourselves and contend with the difficulty of this issue. Embrace the complexity of this, because it's not an easy answer. And let's, get, let's, let's go open source and get ideas on this, because there's not an easy solution either. So my, I, I throw it back to each and every individual in this room, is it's our collective pro problem, it's our collective responsibility. How are we going to deal with this? Because we can't continue. But I think also, if, if nothing is done, and knowing within Surrey, as an example, that uh, there are areas where transit, you, you can't access transit at all. And, uh, and there are uh, those that um, are low income uh, families uh, that don't have cars, that, uh, that need access to services. And so I think if, not, if, if we have to wait until 2017, our economy in the long run will severely be compromised. Uh, when we have businesses coming externally to the Board of Trade that are asking about, can I, uh, I need information about moving to Surrey. They're asking about transportation systems. They're asking about education. They're asking about different support systems. But the number one question is transportation. Can I get my labor force from point A to point B? They can't. Barbara, 
I just Even want the last word here. Oh, okay, I just wanted to very quickly say that that you're quite right. Transit is the issue. Moving around the city is the issue, and moving around the region is the issue. We are trying to do the very best we can to represent the people and the ideas because we're stuck in the same traffic jams. And I just want to add that I don't want it to to be understood that the only things we're considering is LRT and the new Patella Bridge, etc. We are very definitely asking first and foremost. We want buses on the road. We want B buses, B line buses, all the things to put people going and moving to build our ridership and get that going as quickly as possible. So all I can say is continue to contact us, contact council, more ideas, let us know. We'll pass them on. Thank you. I actually have one comment to that as well. I mean, I hear what you're saying about the politics in Surrey, um, but people live in Surrey. And it, 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 no, I, I know, I know, but like for example, I sit on the City of Surrey's Poverty Reduction Coalition and we hear horror stories about people having to have these huge travels just to get to the food bank. It's, it's just, it, and that's where they live. So the context of thinking about transportation is within kind of a, a, a defined geographic neighborhood and that's the stories I keep hearing about and that's so, it is a, it is a regional, it is a regional problem, but we have to look at it with the lens, a local lens, especially from the ridership perspective of people living those, those types of experiences. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to have to close it up for now. Um, if, uh, um, if the panelists are around, there might be opportunities for, for uh, conversations. Um, this is the first, as I said earlier, this is the first Carbon Talks we've had at the SFU Surrey campus, and I'm really glad that everybody came out. Uh, we are interested here at the Surrey campus in engaging authentically with our communities about these kinds of important issues. And uh, uh, we hope you come out to our next event. And thank you for coming today. And I want to uh, give it up for the panelists for, for your contributions and your expertise that you gave us today. Thank you very much.